Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we're going to begin with some episodes dealing with the Pensacola Navy Yard. Now in the 21st century, everyone is alert to the fact that we have the wonderful Pensacola Naval Air Station, the Blue Angels and all of the wonderful things that relate to it. But many have forgotten or never knew that the, its precedent was the Pensacola Navy Yard. And that, of course, began for us very shortly after Florida became part of the United States. The circumstances were basically this. Into the early part of the 1820s, there were revolutions brewing all over Latin America. They had been spawned because people there had seen what had happened with the American Revolution, and then with the French Revolution, and people in Latin America wanted to divorce themselves from Spain. And so one after another, these countries were in revolt. Well, as that happened, of course, people in our own federal government began to be concerned. President James Monroe and uh, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams were almost certain that the British or the French or both might try to take advantage of this power vacuum in Latin America and move in. And that was the last thing the young United States wanted to see happen. So they decided we, we've got to do something as a deterrent. And uh, many, of course, everyone in our audience will remember the, uh, from their history books that the first thing that we did was to uh, make an, an announcement that be became known as the Monroe Doctrine, that basically foreign, other foreign powers were unwelcome in the Western Hemisphere. Now, how are, we, how are they going to take care of that? I mean, making a statement was one thing, but being able to enforce it was something quite different. And so, uh, basically, Mr. Monroe and Mr. Adams took a page out of a, a, a president that would come along many years later, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the idea of walk softly but carry a big stick. And the big stick that they announced almost immediately was that they were going to create what was known as the South Atlantic Squadron or South Atlantic Fleet, a series of vessels that would be on station to the south as a, a, a kind of a preventive stick, if you will, to encourage people not to come into this hemisphere. Well, of course, having a fleet is one thing, but you can't operate it without a station at which uh, repairs could be made, maintenance could take place, and all of that sort of nature, of course, was required. So the next thing that the, feder the federal government decided to do early in the 1820s was to create a naval station. Now, to do this, they appointed a team of three captains. Their names were Warrington, Biddle, and Bainbridge. And these three men, their charge was to go to all of, the, all of the major bays and inlets along the Gulf of Mexico and decide which was best suited to becoming a naval base for this South Atlantic squadron. The men visited here, there, and otherwhere, otherwise, and in, in 1824, they came to Pensacola. Of course, uh, the new city council here, they wined and dined these people, royally rolled out the red carpet. And when the men left, they were very much impressed. And when they made the report to the Navy Department and to the Congress, they recommended that Pensacola become the site of the Navy Yard. Uh, almost at once, the Navy Department appointed one of those three captains, his name was Lewis Warrington, to become the first commanding officer of the yard. And Mr. Warrington arrived here in the middle of the decade to begin that work. Now, he, the, the site, the, the, the place selected for the yard itself was to be on the, on the uh, er, uh, area at the mouth of the bay, very much uh, where the, uh, like where the uh, second Spanish colony had been, uh, uh, Governor Areola, and of course where the uh, Naval Air Station continues to operate in the 21st century. Now, Mr. Warrington had many charges. The first thing he did, of course, was to work with Judge Breckinridge, who had considerable experience here, and the two uh, selected two uh, large uh, areas of, of timber, one of, of uh, live oak and the other of uh, 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 substantial pine. The oak, of course, would be used for repairing or building new ships, and the pine would be for pars and masts and so forth on those ships. About 10,000 acres of each one was selected. All right. Once he was there, then Warrington began to lay out the property to make, uh, to make arrangements for where buildings were going to be located. And of course, as he did this, he recognized that he had to have skilled people, and he had to have them working there, right on the site. Now, uh, it's about, oh, 10 to 11 miles from downtown Pensacola to the site of that original Navy Yard, and thus it was totally impractical 
for people to live in Pensacola and work at the Navy Yard. There was no uh, re regular means of transport back and forth except by water. And so Mr. Warrington went to work and laid out what, they, what became known as the original uh, Navy Yard village where Navy workers would live. And of course, Mr. Warrington, in all due modesty, named the village for himself. And consequently, we had the village of Warrington. Next, he had to have skilled workers. And so Mr. Uh, well, uh, Captain Warrington came into Pensacola and he did a survey to find out how many shipwrights and millwrights and ships carpenters and that sort of thing he could find within the resident population and he found almost none. And so he employed what we would today call a headhunter. The man's name was Nathan Keep. And Mr. Keep then went to a series of Navy Yards in, in Norfolk, Philadelphia, Boston to seek out the kind of workers that uh, Mr. Warrington needed and he signed them up. Now, basically, the, the contract with these people was not only for, for work on, on site, but also they would be given a special perk. When they arrived, they would be given a lot on, in Warrington Village for their use in perpetuity, and they would be given, given help with the uh, uh, purchase and arrangement for supplies to build their own house. And they were, they, the uh, arrangement for the lot in, in the village was, was not as, uh, that they would keep, the, the workmen would keep it so long as they worked there, but they would keep it so long as they had good behavior. Now, I'm not quite sure what Mr. Warrington had in mind on that, but basically that's the way it worked. And so people began to arrive and put the themselves in place and began putting, doing all of those things that were necessary to clear the land, uh, prepare for building the uh, initial structures of the yard. Meanwhile, of course, it made no sense at all to have a Navy Yard sitting there unprotected. And so the second stage of the, of the work here for this particular property was to build a series of forts that would almost literally surround the yard and protect it from sea and attack by land. And to do this, they, they turned this pro the, the Navy turned this project over to the Coast Artillery Department, and they, uh, a, a Colonel Totten uh, was in charge there, and it is his design that came forth for the creation of a series of, of forts which would be, be in this ring, and the uh, Art Coast Artillery appointed an engineer by the name of William Henry Chase to supervise the construction. Mr. Chase uh, had just finished a job on the Mississippi River where he was rebuilding fortifications at New Orleans. And he, Mr. Chase arrived here and was given the assignment of building Fort we would, would, would uh, one day called Fort Pickens, Fort McRae, Fort Barrancas, and of course the Redoubt, which was a, a protection against uh, invasion across from, uh, from uh, Large Bayou. Now, Mr. Mr. Grant, uh, Captain Grant, had the same kinds of problems that, uh, that Captain Warrington did. He looked around, first of all, as sources of raw materials, and secondly, a source of manpower. Now, uh, Chase recognized from the plans he had in hand, he was going to need huge quantities of brick and large quantities of, of timber and lumber, and also some, uh, some bituminous materials which he would have to import. So I uh, looked around, and there, yes, there were some small brickyards here, and there, were, there was another one in Mobile, and there were a couple of small uh, lumber mills, but, but they were nowhere near uh, the capacity that he was going to need. So Warrington did, uh, so Chase did something rather unique. He went up and down the, uh, the Escambia River and located sites where there was clay suitable for making brick. And he also, of course, uh, uh, identified sites where, where lumbering could be done easily. And then he went to a, a number of people who were identified as being uh, well-to-do, and having some money for investment. And he offered them the opportunity to go into the brick making business and assured them that the, uh, the, the uh, fort building process would take all of their production for at least 15 years at a fair price and probably beyond the 15 years. Well, he had no difficulty in signing up seven people who then went into the brick making business up the river and so uh, began to provide that kind of supply. And he did the same thing with people going into the lumbering business, or most of them up the river. And of course, as he did this, he also made arrangements for the building of some barges which would carry this material once it was produced down the river and then across the bay to the, uh, the first of all, the Pickens and then to the others. Now, of course, he, uh, Chase had the same need as uh, Captain Warrington in finding skilled people. And he looked around in, uh, in Pensacola and saw precious little. And then he did something which uh, was typical of what was going on at that time within the United States Army. Now, basically, uh, here's, here's the this, this sort of thing, the way it would work. Uh, let's say that uh, Captain so-and-so uh, has saved some money 
Now, he didn't, at that point in time, he didn't go to Merrill Lynch or, or one of the other brokerage houses. No, no, he took his money, went to a slave market where we, he would invest in the purchase of one or two or three young male slaves. He would bring these boy, put these young boys into what we today call a trade school, and they would learn carpentry or masonry and of the, the basic trades. And then when a job came up in the Army and the, that sort of skills were needed, the Army officer, Mr. Our, uh, Captain so-and-so, would lease his slaves to the, uh, to the project. And this is basically where Captain Chase got his skilled labor. He got the, between 25 and 30 such men who came here, were housed in barracks on the site of the, of the construction, and some of those young men who arrived here in 1828-29 would be here for over 20 years. In fact, they would, uh, I guess we would say they literally grew old in the service here, helping to build the forts. Well, Chase began his work in 1828 and built, first of all, built Fort Pickens. It was on the, of course, on the western uh, tip of uh, Santa Rosa Island, a big fort. It, uh, it consumed, it required over 20 million brick. And when it was finished, it also was armored with, uh, with a total of 250 uh, different size cannon and was a, a major fortification. It took about five years to build Fort Pickens. When that was completed, they moved across the, the bay and began the building, or across, rather, across the Narrows, rather, and began the building of Fort McRae. And that was about half the size of Fort Pickens and, of course, using the same kind of labor and the same kind of raw materials. When that was finished, Finished, the construction moved across the bay and began work on the heights uh, with, the, with the area that was the, called way back in Spanish time called the Barrancas and this is where Fort Barrancas was constructed. And that fort, uh, when it was completed, then they moved still further to the east and built the Redoubt, which was completed about the year 1849, perhaps into 1850. Now the, the interesting part of that, that's, that part of our story is by the time the three forts and the uh, redoubt were completed, the, the problem that had spawned the whole construction project in the first place had largely evaporated. By then, the French and the British had other fish to fry. They were not th a threat to uh, the uh, American administration. And so the forts were there and the Navy Yard was there, but as, as we will see, the, the Navy Yard itself did not have a whole lot to do. Now, the forts themselves, uh, by the way, I, I should mention, I suspect that Fort Barrancas, of course, was named for the High Highland, Fort McRae, was named for a former uh, high-ranking colonel in the uh, in the engineering department of the army, and of course Fort Pickens was named for a a, a man who had been a, a general in the Revolutionary uh, Army, uh, coming from the state of South Carolina, the colony of South Carolina. So the, those were the three. But the just de dealing with the forts themselves, they had practically no use at all for the next 30 years. In other words, Fort Pickens had hardly a man in it up until the time when the war between the states was in the offing. Now the Navy Yard itself, its story was a little bit different. Uh, they 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 uh, completed the yard, uh, got the construction area completed. They built the uh, they fi finished war, uh, with the Warrington village with the, with uh, workers there. They 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 finished that village. And in fact, they they it, they overpopulated, so they had to have a second village. And the second commanding officer here, uh, one who succeeded uh, Captain Warrington, was named Melanchthon Woolsey. And Mr. Woolsey simply picked up the ball as Warrington had left it. And when he needed more space for his workers, they built a, a added a uh, uh, construction of a second village, and uh, once again, uh, uh, Captain uh, Woolsey was uh, was very modest. He named that village for himself too, and so things went on step by step. Uh, the, the people arrived, the villages were were completed, and uh, the operations there began. But they had precious little to do because basically the 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 fleet was almost non-existent. There was not much of a South Atlantic fleet. There were very few calls upon for maintenance, and about the only thing we can say that that, that proceeded here was that the, in the early in the 1830s, uh, to take care of the people on site, the, the Navy Department authorized the building of a hospital. And they sent here a man by the name of, uh, of Isaac Hulse, Captain Isaac Hulse, and we credit uh, uh, Captain Hulse with the beginning of what we now, we still call the Navy Hospital. And we'll, we'll come back to the Navy Hospital and all of the things that Captain Hulse did when we return on the next episode of the story of Pensacola and its Navy Yard.